My name is Brad Rovin. I'm Chief of Nephrology at Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio. I have the privilege of chairing the glomerulonephritis KDGO guidelines with Jurgen Fluga. And I am here today in beautiful San Diego at Kidney Week. Uh, and I'd like to update you on how we have improved and changed the guideline for IgA nephropathy with all the exciting developments in this area of glomerular diseases. So one of the things that is really amazing about this update is that we've completely revised the um, IgA chapter because of all the new clinical trials that have come forward in addition to a, a large set of epidemiologic data suggesting that maybe we didn't have it quite right in terms of what our goals of therapy should be. What we're understanding now from epidemiologic studies in the UK and in the United States is that getting patients down to a proteinuria of one gram per day may not be sufficient to prevent progression towards end-stage kidney disease over their lifetime. And so what we've revised in the current guideline uh, is that we want to get proteinuria as low as possible. And we don't want people to stop at one gram per day if it can be approached lower, but in a safe fashion. The second thing that's really important with this guideline is that we have now approved drugs for IgA nephropathy. We've never had that before. And with the approved drugs, we're learning even more about the pathophy uh, pathophysiology and pathogenesis of IgA nephropathy. And so what we've arranged the guideline to actually reflect is how can we put the new drugs into perspective in treating the patient to do two things. One is the only biomarker we have for IgA nephropathy is proteinuria, so we want to reduce proteinuria as a surrogate of preserving kidney function. But what we really want to do is have a stable glomerular filtration rate, stable kidney function over time. And so uh, to do that, we have based the guidelines on sort of our understanding of the pathogenesis of IG nephropathy. And that harkens back to this four hit model that's currently uh, what we think, which is we have an antigen that is galactose deficient IgA that's overproduced in these patients. And then we form immune complexes. These deposit in the kidney, cause injury. And we now have drugs that can address some of these various aspects of the pathogenesis of the disease. And what we try to do in the new guideline is put into perspective that we will treat the pathogenesis of the disease and at the same time, we want to bring in treatment for any chronic damage to the kidney because most of the patients, not always, but they're often picked up when they already have chronic damage and impaired kidney function. So we want to mitigate the effects of loss of nephron mass and we want to stop the actual disease process. And so this is how we put together the new guideline and I think it reflects these thoughts pretty accurately. As those of you who know me know, I'm a big fan of the kidney biopsy in helping us uh, decide how to treat patients with glomerular diseases. One of the problems with the kidney biopsy in IG nephropathy is that all of the clinical trials to date that have resulted in improved medications have basically used historic biopsies rather than incident biopsies. And so it's very difficult to relate what you get uh, from the histology of a patient you biopsy and how to use that to choose what drug uh, you want to put the patient on or what combination of drugs you want to put the patient on. And so I think for the future as a challenge to the renal community, we need to actually start to investigate the biopsy and how it's affected by the medications we now know actually can reduce proteinuria and preserve GFR in the um, patients with IgA nephropathy. That will allow us to better plan how we might either use drugs in combination or sequence drugs over the course of this disease. So this is something that I think we will have to take up down the road as we refine our ability to manage IgA nephropathy. I get asked a lot, what's the difference between the IgA drugs that have been approved to date. And as, as everyone probably knows by now, we have two drugs that have been fully approved, 
and one drug that has accelerated approval and will hopefully uh, down the road uh, achieve full approval if it preserves uh, kidney function. And the drugs are of really interesting in different categories. Uh, one drug is a gut-released glucocorticoid and the idea behind that is that it will target the pyrus patches uh, in the gut um, immune system. And by doing so, it will actually decrease the production of the antigen. So this is the HIT-1 in the pathogenesis model of IgA nephropathy. Decrease the production of the antigen and therefore decrease immune complex uh, a deposition in the kidney. A lot of folks call that a disease modifying agent. And if you actually look up disease modification, I did a little search, and this actually came up when, um, from rheumatology where they started to introduce anti-cytokine drugs for rheumatoid arthritis. And you think about disease modification as hitting the pathogenesis of the disease. So uh, the category of drugs that are hitting the immunology of IG nephropathy certainly in my mind are disease modifying. But let's be realistic. If we are also bringing in the next category of drugs that's been approved for IG nephropathy, which are the, uh, is the angiotensin and endothelin receptor blocker, they're targeting actually step four in the pathogenesis of the disease, but they're targeting reducing kidney injury after the immune complexes have uh, deposited in, in the kidney. And of course, that's disease modification as well, because if you can slow down the development of kidney injury due to loss of nephron mass, you are going to preserve GFR. And the last drug has, that was most recently approved is an anti-complement drug. And of course, the idea is that when immune complexes deposit in the glomerulus, it activates complement and you achieve inflammation. However, um, Complement drugs may be doing more than that. Some of our own data that we presented at this meeting uh, suggest that complement uh, that we believe is being generated within the kidney may be associated with the chronic injury that we see in IgA nephropathy, so it may mitigate chronic injury as well. In any case, I think it's disease modifying also. So, I'm not so sure we need to apply the word disease modifying. I think all of these drugs are benefiting renal preservation over time in different mechanistic ways, which brings us back to my first point where we have to use the drugs that target different parts of the presumptive pathogenic uh, mechanism of IgA nephropathy causing reduction in kidney function to best get preservation of GFR over time. I had the privilege of actually attending the uh, SPARC uh, meeting, which is the meeting of uh, IGA patients uh, this year uh, that was held in Austin, Texas. And I got to meet lots of patients with IgA nephropathy, and we, we talked a lot about how they feel and how they want to be treated. And, and so I think as we develop drugs, and implement drugs, it's really important to talk with the patients and understand their perception of the disease. One of the things I'm afraid of is in this current era, at least in the United States, of very short visits and lots of patients to see, a lot of patients come away without understanding what their disease is and what that disease can look like down the line and what we can do to actually uh, uh, manage the disease. And now, of course, we have medications, so that conversation is much easier than it was in the past when we didn't have anything besides uh, renin angiotensin system inhibitors. And so I think what we would like to do, and I, I, I know as a group, we have to meet with patients and, and help educate them and help educate the physicians who are really in the first contact with the patient as to what this disease is, how it should be treated, and actually referring the patient early uh, for management by a nephrologist uh, so that we can actually intervene at a time where we have the best chance of maintaining kidney function through their lifetime. I think there's a few barriers to implementation. 
especially um, in the U.S. One of the barriers is that all of the new medications are expensive. And I understand, and I've been involved in development and clinical trials for a long time, but when you start talking about an integrated approach using new medications for IgA nephropathy, then you're putting together three, maybe four drugs that are very expensive, and then the proposition becomes a very costly one. And I think we have to understand what that means, A, for the patient, what it means for society in terms of keeping people active and off uh, dialysis. So uh, there's a balance there. I'm not a healthcare economist, uh, but I'm certain those sorts of things can be um, worked out. Nonetheless, I think cost will come up as a barrier. And for many people who are in the community practicing, trying to get an expensive regimen approved uh, in a busy office practice uh, may not be on the top of their mind. And so we have to fix that. And I'm not entirely certain how to do that, but this is something that I think we have to address in the future because this is the way we're going with all of our glomerular diseases. Some of the other implementations to um, uh, barriers to implementation are sort of the fixed idea that patients with IgA nephropathy do well, period. And that might be, obviously it's been in the textbooks for a long time, but do we have a long-term perspective on our patients? And a lot of patients will come to a physician and then maybe move and change physicians. You don't necessarily have the broad perspective of the patient. But if you're in a, a, the same place, seeing the same people for a really long period of time, you know that these patients actually don't do very well unless you can stop the disease progression. And, and so some people are satisfied with our old goals and, and changing, uh, tradition, if I can use that word, is very difficult in medicine. So again, this is an education uh, sort of issue. Just like I talked about educating patients about what their disease is, a, a patient who knows the disease is an empowered person to actually ask about how to do things with their physician and have a good discussion. Empowering the physicians who are mostly seeing these patients uh, with education is really imperative. And we are trying to do that with the KDGO and we're going to have a nice series of upcoming webinars on applying the guidelines to real life and I think that's gonna be uh, key. The breakthrough in IgA nephropathy really is attributed to a public-private partnership with the Kidney Health Initiative working with the FDA to design clinical trials that would allow us to test medications in a fashion that would be um, achievable uh, in the industry perspective and for patients. And that has caused an explosion of drugs uh, and, and for IG nephropathy as we've seen. What's most exciting to me and really is going to probably perpetuate guideline revisions almost every year or every other year uh, for the foreseeable future, but talking about what I, uh, I think coming up next in content, will be the uh, B cell drugs, and specifically the drugs that are targeting B cell survival factors and B cell growth factors. Um, these drugs are currently in trial. We have uh, phase two data, and they look very good, and we are starting to see these drugs moving into phase three. And in fact, at this meeting, uh, a kidney week meeting, we're gonna see some late breaking abstracts which will show some very impressive GFR preservation data from this particular class of, of, of drugs. So that, to me, is one of the most exciting things that I've I, I know I will see at this meeting that happens to be later this afternoon, but um, I, I know the data, and I think when these are actually done with the phase three trial, assuming they continue being successful and the phase three trial reads out with success and they get approved, then we're gonna attack this again at the KDGO. And it's going to probably rearrange a lot of how we've put the current um, guideline together. 
But I think this is really important because we haven't had this before in any glomerular disease, and now all of a sudden we do. So to me, this is one of the most exciting times in nephrology. And even though Jurgen and I are gonna to have to work hard for the next update, um, it's a pleasure to do that because we finally have something to update.